All right. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for coming tonight to our, our community forum to talk about the progress we've made in investigating the possibility of a new elementary school for Hamilton Wenham. My name is Eric Tracy. I'm the superintendent of schools, and um, I'll be working with a, a large crew tonight to talk to you about some of the finer points. Um, we'll introduce the team in a second. I'll let them all introduce themselves. We have members from the architectural team and um, also members from our Onus project manager team, who's a team that works directly with us to help us through the things that we may or may not understand. So um, you'll hear some different perspectives. You'll you'll get uh, quite a bit of information. There'll be an opportunity for you to kind of give us a little bit of what you're thinking and ask questions. And remember, there is nothing in stone right now. We're, we're really just kind of digging into this and starting to work our way through uh, the, the second phase, really, maybe third phase, if you will, if you look at it, depending on how you look at it, of the process to getting to uh, April 2025, which is where a vote would occur to decide, do we build a school or do we not build a school? So we're still, we still have a long way to go, and uh, tonight we'll give you a little bit of an idea of how things are going. So we'll introduce the team first. Uh, we'll talk to you about the MSBA process. The MSBA is the state agency that we work with um, that is the granting authority, and you'll, you'll learn a little bit about them in, in a little bit through the process, but they are, they are uh, currently uh, giving us the opportunity to uh, almost split the project. They're right now uh, willing to uh, reimburse approximately 47.6% of the cost of the project from the state, so that is an, an opportunity you don't see very often. Many towns are in the 30% range. Um, so 47% and we'll talk a little bit more about how we can add to that percentage through the process later. We'll show you the timeline and the milestones along the way. We'll talk to you about some of the community outreach that we've done. We've done quite a bit since our first, I think, our farmers markets back in October. Um, visioning and educational planning and those are the processes that we use uh, to really determine uh, which direction we go in, but also how things get developed and designed our educational plan gets handed off to these guys and they take it from there and work their magic. Um, they'll do some design team updates. They'll give us some kind of behind the scenes look at what's happening so far. We'll talk about next steps and we'll take some questions. Um, it's, a, it's a pretty informal process, but we're gonna hope to hold the questions till the end so we can get a microphone out there so people can hear you and we'll do our best. We are on HW Camp tonight, they are recording, so um, we want to be able to make sure everybody can hear that's uh, on, online as well. Um, I'm going to do some intros next. Barbara Peter. Yeah, sure. So I'm Peter Morgan. I'm a lead designer for JCG Architecture, so leading the project design uh, from the architecture side. My name is uh, Nick Massey. I am uh, one of the project managers for PMA Consultants, the owner's project manager. My name is Kevin Nigro. I'm a managing director with PMA Consultants. As Nick said, we are the owner's project manager. We are one of the uh, first teams that the district brings on, and our goal is to assist the district in navigating the MSBA process, meeting all the milestones, checking all the boxes, and making sure that your educational plan and needs of both Hamilton and Wenham are met. One of our first tasks that we worked with Eric and the school building committee team on is hiring JCJ, our architects, so we'll let them continue to introduce themselves. Thank you, Kevin. My name is Alicia Caratano. I'm the project manager for JCJ Architecture. Good evening. My name is Jim LaPasta, and I'm a principal with JCJ Architecture. This next slide um, is really a uh, Hamilton Wenham specific uh, timeline for you folks to understand where your local uh, school building committee, uh, when they're voting on, on big items, what they're approving. Oh, it doesn't help when I stand in front of it. Um, <clears throat> the, uh, the big one here on the, on, on the timeline is the uh, town vote. Uh, there will be a town meeting set for April 5th in 2025 uh, and a ballot vote uh, for you residents uh, on the 10th of April. Uh, the MSBA process, this slide will show you um, what we've been up to. Uh, they call Module 3, which is the preliminary design program and the preferred schematic report. 
Uh, right now we are in the preferred schematic report, which is narrowing down the options to get to one preferred solution or preferred option, uh, which we would study then in the schematic design, which is module four. Um, this slide just shows you a few bullet points uh, on what each module or what each uh, phase consists of. Um, the big, the big thing with the preferred schematic is um, getting rough order of estimates and narrowing down uh, those options with uh, when school building committee will see all the options they've understood, all the studies that have been done, and they'll be able to um, uh, educationally uh, make the right decision. Give it over to Eric. So one of the first hurdles we're working with right now is that the school department doesn't own any of the elementary schools. We lease all three elementary schools. Buker, Winthrop, and Cutler are all leased uh, from the towns. Winthrop, from, from, uh, the, the, Winthrop and Cutler actually are both leased from Hamilton. For us to continue with this project and to gain MSBA funding, uh, we have to uh, get a lease extension for at least 50 years. That is a requirement of the state to have, quote, control of the property. Um, we've been leasing for many, many, many years from the community. So uh, last week, the select board in Hamilton had uh, voted and granted us a lease to the Cutler property for that 50 years. That is the first step. They, the, the select boards in town are only able by law to uh, agree to a 30 year lease. Uh, the next extension of that would have to go to town meeting. So that would go to town meeting as well to uh, be decided by the, the voters. But Really, it's just an opportunity for us to continue to lease that Cutler site from the town of Hamilton. Uh, as you may or may not know, the town of Hamilton is also working and exploring the MBTA overlay. Uh, and that is a, a, a state law that was passed recently that um, really requires housing, a certain set number of housing to be built around uh, MBTA stations within, I think it's a half mile of the MBTA stations. And part of that is finding a place to build these, these places. Um, the one, one thing we've learned through the process, I just, just watching the news, town of Milford, I believe it was, said, you know, we're not gonna do that. That's crazy that you're gonna hold us to that. And the state immediately pulled the funding from the town. So it's, a, it's, a, it's an important piece of the puzzle uh, as we look into this project. Uh, the Winter Project uh, property is 14 acres and, and gives the town opportunity to begin to meet some of the requirements of the MBTA overlay, um, you know, which is, which is, as I said, it's, it's a big deal. And, and I think communities are scrambling now to figure out how to, how to meet the requirements, but also to do it well. And, and I think Hamilton's started, the first planning board discussion I heard was well back in either September or October. So it's, it's been kind of in, in discussions, but there's still a long way to go. This slide is, um, I get the fun one. This is about the MSBA grant program. When we started back in, uh, I think it was August of 2023, the MSBA hadn't increased the statewide reimbursement for school projects for quite some time. They were feeling the effects of COVID, the supply chain issues, just like everybody else and everyone else that does the grocery shopping knows, I don't have to tell you. But when we started this program, the reimbursement rate per square foot for eligible costs, and we'll get into that, was about $433 a square foot. As we were in our first design phase here, preliminary design investigation, an MSBA board meeting held in October raised the reimbursement rate for the cities and towns to $605 a square foot for eligible costs. So that vote alone will realize millions of dollars in extra savings for the towns of Hamilton and Wenner. Our reimbursement rate, as Eric said, is approximately 47.6%. It's a base that we start with. As we work through the modules with the MSBA and we pick our preferred schematic, and before we go out to the voters, the MSBA will give us our final reimbursement rate. We have the ability to get incentive points. This school is going to be built to be sustainable. We had some Sustainability members uh, come to some of our earlier meetings. We heard you loud and clear. It's part of our program. If we meet LEED and sustainable uh, guidelines, we can receive two to three additional reimburse reimbursement points. Your district does a good job 
doing the best they can keeping up with the schools. There's maintenance points available. We expect that the town will get at least another 1%, maybe even more, towards uh, a high reimbursement. So while we're at 47% now, we have the ability to gain more and we will pursue that throughout the um, phases. And uh, Nick's gonna tell you about some of the outreach we've done today. Thank you, Kevin. Um, it is great to see a lot of familiar faces here, uh, many who we've met at a lot of these community outreach uh, events. This is a cool little slide I put together. We're running out of room, um, <laughs> running out of colors too. Uh, but uh, we've, uh, ever since uh, September 29th, Eric mentioned it before, September 29th and October 6th, we were at your farmer's markets. Uh, and we've been at it ever since. Um, we've had, um, we've met with the Hamilton Council on Aging. We've met with the Women's Enrichment Group. We've met with the Winthrop School Council. Rosie, good to see you as always. Um, we've had educational program verification meetings. We've had educational visioning workshops. And even as recent as um, a couple weeks ago, that Saturday, we uh, went to the Memorial Elementary School in Manchester by the Sea uh, for some Hamilton Wenham staff to understand what a new school could look like. We'll hand this over to you. This is not the school we're trying to build. This is actually the Manchester Memorial Elementary School. The town of Manchester and Essex, if you know, are similar to us, regional schools. They, are in the, they were in the process of building back in 2017, 18, 19. I think they finished this in 20, right? 20? You guys actually did this design. Open the building in 21 Yeah, open the building in 21 and the whole site in 2022. 20, so this is fairly a recent model that has been built close by. So we took the opportunity to take some of the members of the building committee and some of the members of our teaching staff, our elementary teaching staff, to see what can be. And there, there are huge changes. You know, I, I uh, just, just in my lifetime, the changes in education and the way education is designed and the needs of kids has been fairly dramatic. Uh, this school is designed to fit into a neighborhood. If you walk around this building towards the back side, there are houses right along the back side of, of this house. There's a, there's a sports field on another side playground on the other side and a parking lot. Uh, it's also dipped right in the middle of a fairly substantial area of wetlands and um, building this project actually, ha actually helped to, to uh, better the, the, the way the, the wetlands were being diverted and, and changed. This is when the front, right when you walk in the front door, you, if you look straight through the middle of this, those doors are the front doors and when you come in it's a big welcoming space. Uh, there's a, a a double stairway on your right hand side just for our community meetings, class meetings, small group meetings. So you can bring a whole group of kids to that space, have a little meeting with them, and then they go back off to their classrooms. Up on the top right, you can see some of the colors. Go back to that slide. See some of the colors that were blended in. JCJ and their team uh, really tried to get the Manchester by the Sea feel. So you see some fish, you'll see some greens and blues, and that's supposed to be representative of sea glass. Um, um, but more often, most often, uh, excuse me, more importantly, in this facility, safety is, is a primary uh, mode. So when you first come in those front doors, you can't get into the building without checking in at a window in between a foyer. Uh, we don't have that option at any of our schools right now. We, you can just walk into our schools uh, without being greeted in a, couple of, in a couple of places. There's a lot of natural daylight in this school. It comes in from all angles. Uh, some of the rooms were uh, developed, like the preschool rooms were developed with almost full glass walls on two sides to really pull in the natural light. You know, we had teachers walk into these rooms and go, wow, it just hits you right, right when you walk in. Uh, they're bright, open spaces. Themes were important. And then the, the reality of coming into this space and feeling like, wow, this is a great place to be. And I think anybody that goes in there gets that feeling right away. Next slide. The, um, this is a second floor hallway. That second floor hallway is quite wide. It's, I'm going to guess it's probably 18 feet wide, maybe-ish. That's a good guess, right? Jim's keeping me on track here. Uh, have, when you walk down this hall, it's very different than when you walk down one of our elementary school halls because you can see kids on the right in little breakout areas. They're right outside their classrooms. You don't see any lockers or cubbies, you know, the wooden cubbies that we've all been using for 50 years. Um, none of those are showing here. You can see all different ways kids can... Uh, get together and learn, opportunities for interventions, opportunity for whiteboards. There's a whiteboard right behind that front group of three kids. Uh, there's tack boards there to hang up student work. 
but also, more importantly, flexible furniture, which is a big deal uh, nowadays in education. So the flexible furniture comes in handy. It can be moved around. It's all able to be pushed around and moved around by kids without having to worry about adults having to move everything and wait for everything. Um, so it's really functional um, for the, from the kids' side. The kids really enjoy it. We, if you come into our classrooms, we have a mismatch of furniture. Thank you to the Ed Fund. Uh, the Ed Fund has really pumped a lot of money into uh, different types of furniture in our elementary schools because kids are moving, kids are sitting, kids are up. Uh, so that's been uh, helpful for um, really keeping kids engaged in the school opportunity. You have a, a large window at the end, again, more natural light. It continues all the way around the school. And then the, the lockers and corridor thing is, is, is important because when you go into the classroom, all of the cubbies are in there and they're on wheels. And each teacher has them configured differently. Some use them as part of the classroom learning experience to block off spaces and create smaller learning uh, opportunities within the, the classroom. Others use them to, as barriers for you know, groups of kids to be able to some over here, some over here, and then they can spill out into the hallway and actually use the hallways as well. One more slide on and this is their gym. Uh, interesting, gym with an auditorium. And the other side where we're standing on this side, there is a wall that opens up into the cafeteria. Uh, so this is what can be. This is a fairly large gym for, you know, bigger, much bigger than you, your, any of the gyms we have in our elementary schools. Uh, but the nice part is they have a stage for big events. They have a number of different basketball configurations, I think three full courts within that system. And they also have the ability to open sliding doors between the gym and the cafeteria and connect to spaces for big community events. That's one thing you'll see as we continue through the, the slide presentation. Community for us is important because we do believe that the school district is really the hub of the community. We have opportunities to bring people in and have people use our spaces. And we want to design around that to, to, to give us the best design possible. And then the security separating interior. So you have a, a situation now where we spend far too much time talking about bad things that can happen in schools. And it's an unfortunate thing, whether it's, a, whether it's because of a firearm or because of an intruder or because of just something accidental. Uh, that's really a change in school. And if you go to this school, uh, they have security like right when you get in, you can't get, you can't get directly access to the building. Uh, they also have doors that close. And can you go back one slide? In these call corridors, at the beginning of these corridors, there are, there are large doors that close to seal off the corridor and keep people inside safe. Um, Danvers also built a new elementary school, same types of things in there, uh, different types of glass tinting and the way they use their, their um, design of the building to allow security measures to happen, including uh, the opportunity in I don't know how many places, I think maybe three or four different places, for a teacher to walk up with a card, touch it, and everything locks down. So if you see something and you want to, you know, you need to move, you just hit it with your card if you're a staff member the entire building will lock down. So there's opportunity for us to, to more firmly secure our kids and our staff uh, during the school day. <clears throat> the educational program is really the heart of what we plan to do. Take the time to take a look at it. I wrote it, I want you to read it. You know, uh, Myself, the director of teaching and learning, director of uh, student services, uh, several of our principals chimed in to try to figure out the best way to best meet the needs of the kids in our community. You're starting to look at kids with uh, greater needs, um, greater levels of disability that we include in our schools, and that's important to be able to make sure we have the things in place to make that happen. So the educational design is driven by the learner, driven by our mission and our vision in the district and our core values. We're looking at all different enrollment options, which we'll show you in a little while. So we had to configure all of those, like how many, how many different rooms would you need for each of these enrollment options, whether you build a small 280 student elementary school or a larger 700 student elementary school. You're looking at core content spaces, embedded, embedded educational services. We currently service kids in closets, on the stage, and in the places you would never ever believe it would happen. If you go into the Winthrop School, there's a nice stage in there when you walk in, it's beautiful. Yeah, open the curtains, there's a classroom in there. It's a classroom for special education students uh, because we just don't have any space. We are overflowing at the Winthrop and the Bucher School. Things like music, music occurs, it was occurring for the first half of the year at the Bucher School in the cafeteria because that's the only space we could put it without it interrupting things in all the other classrooms. 
multi-use breakout spaces. We showed you a picture a minute ago of those kind of spill out spaces at the Manchester School. Those are opportunities for us to take advantage of for kids that are receiving interventions. We have a fairly substantial intervention program that uh, we have actually staff in all three buildings that are working on interventions all day long, as well as other things like occupational therapy, physical therapy, speech and language therapies um, that ha can't happen in the middle of a classroom. So we need places to put those things. So you'll see that in some of the, 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 the conversations we have tonight. And then community access spaces. We want the community to use our gyms. We want our community to take advantage of the cafeteria, come in and have a meeting, use our outdoor spaces, because it's your school too. And the reality is we, you know, we, we did the Buker gym last year. We put a fairly substantial amount of money into the gym and we relined the floor, but we also relined it. It's gonna sound weird, but we relined it for not only basketball and a few other things, but pickleball, because that's the thing, you know? So we now have a fairly a uh, heavy number of people that come in and play pickleball in the evenings when kids are not there. So those are the opportunities we're trying to build into our, our schools to really make it part of the community and not just something you drive by every day and wonder what happens inside. The goals and priorities, really we want it to be intentional with our outdoor spaces to be able to say, okay, how can we take advantage of the outside, bringing the outside in? Small learning communities, we'll show you a little sample the other in a few more slides. Small learning communities are the key to education, in, in, in this is my opinion, to education right now because you have the ability to reconfigure over and over and over. Whether you put all of your first grade kids in the same exact place and leave them there during the year, or whether you put a first grade, a second grade, a third grade, a fourth grade, and a fifth grade in there, um, then you have a mentor opportunity, you have the ability for kids to take advantage of uh, other teachers within, within that small learning community. So that's really a center of what we wanted to do. We want people to have strong relationships and that's what we pride ourselves in. If you read our NEOSC report from the high school, you know, that's one of the things that jumps right out. The teacher-student relationship is really strong here at the high school. Um, it's the same for all of our other schools. Kids know our, um, teachers know our kids, they know our parents, and we want to continue to make those connections. Um, feeling a sense of belonging. We want people to feel like they, they come to school and they belong here. This is their school. We also want parents and community members to do that as well. Flexibility, I talked about all the seating, that's the first part of flexibility, but also having opportunities and spaces for kids to go to do things. You know, you have that group of kids that is always done. They're done first. There's always like four kids done first. What do you do with them? Well, you have an opportunity in some of the designs we're looking at to move them right, out, right next door to your building, or right, I mean, your classroom, or right outside your classroom, and move further and, and push them more into an extended opportunity so that you can now focus as a teacher on trying to get everybody else in the same spot. Um, we're looking at spaces and programs and structures to meet the needs. Like I talked about, we have more kids with um, occupational therapy, physical therapy, speech and language uh, therapies that occur during the school day. Um, so we, we need you know, spaces to do that. Right now, they, there's physical therapy happens in one school in a closet because that's the space we have. Um, it's a little bigger, but it's not, it's not the most conducive. Um, preserving, whoops, sorry, preserving, bridging the community. So we said academic and social emotional foundation. Kids are still feeling the effects of COVID. They are absolutely feeling the effects of COVID. Kids are still dysregulated all the way down to the kindergarten preschool level. So much so that we need the ability to be able to move them around, uh, give them spaces to, you know, we'll call calm down. Like we need a place for them to calm down and for someone like one of our counselors to work with them. So we're thinking about all of those connections and then sustainability but as a learning tool imagine going into your school and having this big dashboard in the front lobby that shows how much electricity is being generated by the solar panels on the roof how much geothermal energy you're getting from your geothermal pump or how much activity is happening within your your plumbing systems those are opportunities we have for teaching and learning to build right into the school so the kids can see it in action and use it to grow and learn with next slide and then equity, we really want to have our kids have the same experience. We want kids to have the same opportunities. When I first took over as superintendent, one of my first goals, if you go back and read my, my entry plan, was to make sure that kids at the elementary level all got the same opportunity, no matter which third grade classroom they were in. And that's part of the equity piece for us. It's important to make sure our kids all get to the same experience and that our parents can depend on that experience no matter where their kids are going to school. Um, 
commu the community piece again, making peer collect connections, integration of play, which is important at the elementary level. Uh, sometimes when I need a break, I go to kindergarten and just chill out and play. <laughs> it's like the best medicine ever. Um, really giving kids some choice and agency. Sounds weird at the elementary level, but it's amazing to watch kids like the fifth grade leadership day at Cutler when the fifth grade takes over the school and they create all of these opportunities within the school for the other kids to learn. So they take something they know and they'll teach other kids and they'll have all these different groups going throughout the day. Kids are teaching kids every day on YouTube, whether we know it or not. Kids are teaching kids every day outside of school, whether we know it or not. So there's some cool things happening. We want to be able to leverage that. And then exploring kids' interests. We don't really have a very strong STEM program, but you'll hear as we move along the opportunity to build in a STEM project, um, a, a STEM classroom for some of our na learning neighborhoods so that we can get kids into STEM earlier in our school district. And this, this is a, another really strong outcome of this. And then where and when students work. You don't need to sit in a desk in a chair to learn. You know, my, I am a very uh, visual kinesthetic learner. If you said to me, this is how you do a break job, I can't do it. If you showed me how to do it, I can repeat it, no problem. That happens in our schools as well. And we want to be able to give kids the flexibility to do um, the work where they feel like they can do it the best. There's one more. So small learning neighborhoods with embedded media. So your library experience and your school experience. So when you were in elementary and middle school, you went to the library. Uh, that's not so true right now. We're looking at a model that integrates the library into these learning neighborhoods and gives kids the opportunity to have what they need right there, right where, they're, right where their classrooms are. Being adaptable and flexible, again, desks and chairs are not necessarily the answer for all kids, so what are the flexible ways we can bring in different furniture so that teachers and students can move around the building and take advantage of it all? We want kids to be curious. We talked about using the building as a tool. I want kids to be able to go outside and continue to learn right outside their classroom and take advantage of what's out there. Indoor and outdoor connectedness. We want to bring the outdoor into our school, outdoors into our school. So think about you know, some type of a, a Zen garden, if you will, in the front lobby so that kids can start to study basic biological features of plants and growing. You see those experiments in our school. Go to Cutler, there's a whole bunch of Gallon, pail, um, gallon milk cartons outside at the front door where kids in the kindergarten are doing a seed growing experiment to see if they grow in the winter. Those are things we can do both in and out of the building and be able to pull the outside in. And then honoring student work. We want to be able to show what our kids know and what they can do. And we want our kids to look up and be proud of that work. You go into the high school library several times during the years, Things change almost, you know, every, probably every quarter. You'll see different art uh, displays, you'll see different uh, projects that kids are working on. And that's an important piece of the learning, to be able to show what you know, but also to be able to have a really good conversation about what you know. Tell me what you learned and what this represents. And part of that is using um, student work through the building, throughout the building. And right now it's tough in some of our buildings. So this is an example of one of our design principles, learning neighborhoods. This would be six classrooms with also a, a, a special education place for kids that maybe need a substantially separate program. We, we have some in our schools. Um, we, we still would have to carry that into our new school if we, if we build a new school. Uh, planning room for staff right there in the same neighborhood. Teachers and kids are co-located. Kids can come out of the classroom and use spaces also take advantage of an outdoor classroom. This is not a plan that we're looking at. This is one opportunity to take advantage of something like a learning neighborhood. The learning neighborhoods also allow you to bring technology into the neighborhood, to bring library media into the neighborhood so that kids get what they need right there. So if you're a parent of a five-year-old or a six-year-old or a seven-year-old and you're wondering, oh my God, my kid's gonna go into this giant school and get lost, this is how they get to make the connections and this is where they gain their sense of belonging in the building. They're here and they're with their peers every day in their, in their localized neighborhood getting all the services and the things that they need uh, throughout their school day. I'm going to take a break. <laughs> that's okay, I was really enjoying that, that was great.
So um, one, of, one of the roles that we have as architects is to take the educational plan, which is the foundation, and help the community figure out what that looks like three-dimensionally and what other things can happen. And a key component of that is how can the building support health and wellness. So you heard a lot about that, I think, from the superintendent in terms of the, the importance of social and emotional well-being. We've talked about sustainability, and sustainability really is a lot more than just thinking about energy use or the impact of the buildings on fossil fuels and the larger environment. It's also about the impact on the human beings that are in that school, whether they're young children who are far more impacted by toxins in materials, they're far, they, they breathe more air per pound of body, so they're just more impacted by anything in the environment, or the teachers who are there every day. It's a workplace, too. It's not just, you know, I have to always think about a school as a workplace. My dad was a ninth grade teacher for 30 years, so we thought a lot about schools as workplaces. And when he taught back in the 60s and 70s, he came home every day reeking of cigarette smoke because you would walk by the teacher, you all probably, I see a lot of nodding, right? You'd walk by the teacher room, the door would open, the blue cloud would come out, um, and then they would go back in. And that wasn't a healthy environment, and it wasn't, and we've come so much further. So this is an example of what a healthy classroom could look like. This happens to be one of the early childhood rooms at the Manchester Memorial School, so it's a relatively new building. I think the first thing you may notice um, about a healthy school is it's bright. There's daylight. There's lots and lots of data out there about the impact of daylight and, and sunlight on, on health and wellness and even test scores and even making students do better and feel better. So the first thing is big windows, lots of daylight. Take advantage of the outside. Superintendent talked about bringing the outdoors in. Well, you can do that by bringing plants in, but you can also do that by making the outside a part of your everyday experience with windows that, that you can see the trees, you can see the plants, you can observe the weather. Not every day is a beautiful sunny day like this was, but there's a lot to be said for that because it becomes a teaching and learning experience as well. The other thing you can't see, but you will notice when you walk into any room is the acoustical qualities of the room. Uh, we wanna make sure that the room supports good hearing, we want to make sure the teacher doesn't have to shout all day. So some of that is, is acoustics that keep outside noises from coming in, keep the inside noise to an appropriate level for conversation and learning, but also technology can help. Um, you can look at adding voice enhancement technology so that all students can get, uh, the teacher can wear a, a, a microphone, and as they're teaching, they can use their normal voice. They don't have to enunciate, and every student in the room can hear equally. So if you're talking about equity, part of equity is can I hear what's going on wherever I am in the room? Can the teacher get my attention? Um, I may not have a hearing disability. I may just have an earache or I may be not paying attention. So many different reasons to think about the acoustics in the room. Um, thermal comfort. Nobody can learn if they're too hot or they're too cold. Um, this is, the, the climate is changing. We need to be adaptable. This school building will uh, need to last 50 years. And over the next 50 years, there will be likely dramatic changes in the temperature and in the climate in this, in this part of the country. It's just a fact. And, he, and you just want to be able to make sure you're comfortable, right? Cool when you need to be cool, warm when you need to be warm. Too many of our older buildings have poor air circulation, poor thermal control, and your schools are no different. You're in, you're in the same boat as a lot of places. Older systems really didn't support that. And then lastly, just to quickly touch on it, I, I mentioned it before, but healthy materials. And that's everything from the furniture that gets selected, what's, what the furniture is made from, the flooring materials, the paints on the walls, the ceilings, making sure there's no materials that, that are on what we would call a red list, which would be bad, have unhealthy off-gassing. We also want to make sure that while they're maintainable materials, you don't need to use toxic chemicals to clean them. So a lot of conversation will be happening with the district maintenance staff to make sure that the maintenance protocols also are thought about so the materials that go in the building will not only last but can be maintained in a healthy way because the worst thing would be to put a bunch of healthy materials in and then come in and cover it with a bunch of toxins later because that's not going to help anybody. So there's a lot to this and this is a cornerstone of what a healthy and sustainable school can be and while we use the classroom as an example this happens throughout the entire building and the site. Doing sustainability. So, speaking of sustainability, um, sustainability is something that we bake right into the process from the outset in the way that we both design the site 
in the building. So in March, we had a great collaborative workshop with 26 people from the district, district, the SBC, the town, the community, some parents, and we all got together and talked about sustainability goals for the project. Some of the important things that we talked about were additional reimbursement that we've touched upon earlier. And right now, we are in the current iteration of this program, we're eligible for additional 3% or an additional plus one, so that would be 4%, depending on the design that's pursued. And we'll be pursuing a LEED Silver Minimum certification. And um, part of the other important things that we'll be considering is some of the additional incentives that are available through the um, in, um, Inflation Reduction Act for federal tax credits, as well as utility incentives from the Mass Save program. So those are some important additional opportunities. And of course, we looked at the, some of the sustainability goals that the district has in terms of the climate action plan and how that can affect the project. The, one of the things that we did was gave a good introduction, general high level introduction to LEAD. People at the meeting had different, um, obviously, familiarity with the program. And so we had JCJ and their sustainability experts, Soden, sustainability led the workshop and we had all our disciplines there the civil engineers the landscape architects the important mechanical engineers that the gym talk about that will be really dealing with the, the air quality the plumbing engineers for water usage so it was a great collaborative discussion and uh, so we reviewed that scorecard and as I said we're at a lead silver minimum right now and at the end of this we talked about opportunities for the project which like everything we do the most exciting opportunities are those that are grounded in the educational plan and as Eric talked about so eloquently we're looking to make this building a teaching tool and even starting in the design process now we want this to be a collaboration with interaction of students and teachers to talk about how we can make that happen so in addition to sustainability Security is also of paramount importance, as you've heard Eric speak about. So in, on March 20th, we had a meeting with the first responders from Hamilton and Wenham, the police and fire departments, the design team, the owner's project manager, the district, and we talked about some important criteria that the first responders would have for any design that was selected, and we made them understand that right now we're reviewing multiple options and so we talked about criteria for the site, important things including, you know, fire lane widths and the fact that in general, we want this to feel like a very safe and secure, but also a welcoming place to come to school. So in addition to the site requirements, we got into some detail about the building and the fire protection communication systems. And we said that this is obviously the first of many discussions and we'll be coming back to speak to them again in schematic design once we have a preferred option that we've selected. One of the, one of the significant parts of this, this early, these early phases of this part of the project is to ultimately select a site and then as we've been talking about get down to a singular design option and as you'll see in a few minutes there are many design options that have been looked at and many that are still uh, on the table. But really the first thing that we have to do is, is work with the school building committee and the community to come up with a series of criteria. Because you have to evaluate everything fairly and this is something the MSBA requires. It's also the right thing to do. And it's something that they're going to be looking for to see how, how the district went about it. So these are some of the uh, uh, evaluation criteria as you look at a site and at the options. Um, and they're all rated, they're, they're all, there's a, a more detailed list and everything gets, gets a ranking by every member of the school building committee as they move towards, um, towards selection. So there's educational goals first and foremost. I know we keep saying it, but it's super important to understand that the educational plan drives everything. The MSBA will be evaluating whether they ultimately reimburse the project in large measure on how well does this plan that the community has selected match up with the educational plan and program. And if they don't support each other, there'll be a lot of questions and a lot of work um, it, needs to, it needs to happen. So, you know, are the adjacencies, are the rooms together in a way that matches the vision? Um, are the spaces going to be adaptable? Is there future growth? Um, they want us to see a 50-year building, but they also want to see, can you grow in that building? Can the building adapt over time to different grade configurations, different enrollments? They want to understand how that's going to work. 
Um, and they also want to know if you're building on an existing site, if that's an option you choose, how will this impact the existing building and the existing school? So how do you keep a, a school operating safely and uninterrupted while you build next to it or, or renovate it? So those are, those are evaluations, some of the evaluations for education. Cost and schedule. Swing space, which means do you have any place to put kids while you're working in their building? That's an option. A lot of districts don't. Um, some districts do. It's unusual to have that kind of space. Um, minimizing cost, cost effective, risk, schedule risk. Looking at these things, building certain places are more risky than others. Certain types of construction more risky than others. So those are, those are things that are considered under the cost. And then community, um, we've talked about it a lot. And as, as plans develop, you'll see this again and again. But do, does the site and do building options provide good, safe, after hours community access? You saw the, the slides of Manchester Memorial earlier in that gymnasium, one of the things that that can, that can be opened separate from the entire rest of the school. Um, not just in the evenings, as many schools can, but even during the day. There are doors that lock and separate that, so on polling days, residents can come into the gym and vote and leave and park in a separate area without having to enter the actual school building. So that's a, that's a big accommodation to the community in terms of community use beyond uh, say, men's league coming in and using the gym in the evening. Um, we'll, be looking, we'll be looking at other things um, like safety measures we've talked about, sustainability, efficiencies. Um, and if you look at the site, um, outdoor activities, are there learning opportunities? Um, how does it impact the neighbors? What's the topography like? Is there a ledge? Yeah, pretty much anywhere in town that we look at it, we're going to find that. Uh, are there wetlands? Yeah, pretty much everywhere in town, we're going to find that as well. Um, safe routes, um, we're going to be looking at, at um, parking, you know, both for during the day and special events. So there's a whole list of criteria. And when you look at every site, every option, they all are better or worse in all these categories. So it becomes a, a question of looking, rating, evaluating, and then beginning to be able to stack options up one versus the other. This which leads us to this chart, which I know everybody cannot see because I'm standing here and I have a hard time with it. But we wanted you to see each of the building committee members, which is each row going across each member uh, was asked to rank the, the items that um, were just spoken of just before this. So each of those items was put in order on the left side. Each member of the committee was asked to rank them. What these represent, each column represents all of the different configurations on the two sites, the Winthrop and the Cutler sites. So it starts on the left with that kind of brownish, yellowish. That's really a code upgrade. What if we just took the elementary school that we have and upgraded it to, to the code, the current ADA standards? And it works across with the pink are Cutler renovations. Those are four different options for renovation. The next blue group are uh, Cutler new construction, those are the next options. The pink three after that are the Winthrop options uh, for renovation, and then on the blue, the three blue on the end are the Winthrop new construction options. So when you look at that, we have 14 options that we came to on those two sites, and that's where we began. And you can see there are a number of lines through those options and through the ranking process, through some of the things like the lease agreement um, through, the, through the select board. Uh, we really knocked out a number of these options because they may not have met the feasibility, um, I mean, excuse me, the educational plan. They met, may not have uh, been able to uh, be cost effective because of the way you'd have to do an addition renovation. So for example, the Winthrop School would be really expensive to do a, a, a new school in any way, shape or form because you have to do it in segments and many years ago I did a six segment build and it was long, it was arduous and it was dirty and dusty and you don't really want to do that with elementary kids but that's, those then tend up being the most uh, expensive options because they take the longest because they take down a section, they build a section, they move kids into that section, they take down the next section, it just kind of goes round and round. So we'll show you a little tighter uh, look at this in a second but there are currently um, the two options on the far left uh, that are the code upgrade and the addition renovation of the current buildings. 
Those will stay in the pipeline for a little while. We, we know that neither one of those meets our educational plan. And then there are three lot options where you see those blue arrows on the top left at the Cutler site. The Winthrop site was totally washed out when the, the agreement for the lease from the select board uh, was met, uh, la not last Monday, the Monday previous to this. Uh, so that kind of took all those sites off of the table. All right, so I'm gonna walk through the, uh, the options that are still on the table. And we're gonna take a quick look at the uh, C1.0, which is this, the uh, Cutler code upgrade base repair. Um, this does not meet the educational plan, um, but it's still on the table as a requirement from the MSBA uh, to meet the requirements. So I'm just gonna walk through some of the uh, salient points about this. Um, this is the 285 student uh, enrollment. So it satisfies the Cutler school population only. Um, it is a, a renovation of the existing 45,000 square foot building. Um, the colors, the pink is, represents uh, um, renovation. And in the future options, you'll see a blue color that's actually addition or new uh, construction. So in this option, pink is renovation. So we're renovating the existing school. Uh, we know that there are some, some pros to doing this. Uh, this does not impact a lot of the site infrastructure. Uh, nothing really has to change in terms of septic, uh, utilities. Uh, the bus operations remain the same. Um, it also keeps the whole building. So retaining an, a building that exists already is, is an advantage to some degree. Um, on the con side of that though, as I said, it does not meet the educational program. If we look at the ed program that the district wrote, this school will not satisfy that as we move forward. Um, as well, when we had the, uh, the meeting with the uh, first responders and, and fire marshal last week, he wants to see a full fire access road around the building. We can't accomplish that on this site, so that's also falling into the sort of disadvantages category. Um, additionally, if, this, if the district grows, we can't really absorb many more students into this facility without doing an addition. And clearly, this is a hilly site. Um, I'm sure many of you are familiar with the site. Uh, a lot of topography, a lot of grade change. Uh, accessibility is an issue both inside the building and outside the building. So working with that building is gonna be a challenge uh, as we move forward in the future. And as Eric was talking about construction phasing, this would be a long uh, phase project to renovate this building, so expensive in the end. So the first uh, renovation addition, addition option is C2.1. Uh, this is keeping the existing classrooms, there's 12 classrooms in the, in the existing school that we're holding on to. Also, we're holding on to the cafeteria and stage because that, those actually do meet their current enrollment uh, for 285 students. So we're preserving about 22,000 square feet of the existing building and adding on uh, roughly, I can't see these numbers from down here, uh, 61,000 square feet. Um, so advantages to this is we're preserving really the best part of the original building, the classrooms. Um, also the cafeteria and stage, so some savings in that. Uh, it also presents a new image of the school from the street, so when you drive by on Asbury Road, you'll see a new school, essentially. Um, and it also creates that sort of protected interior courtyard, so we can do some outdoor learning in that courtyard space in between the existing building and the, and the proposed new building. But this only serves the Cutler population. It doesn't do anything for the Buker or Winthrop school population, so that's a negative. And we also can't uh, accomplish the full fire access road around the building. Uh, again, phasing is, is extended on this particular kind of project, so it would be a long construction schedule and potentially a lot more expensive. So option C3.1 is the first new option. This does meet the ed plan for the smallest enrollment of 285 students. Um, this is uh, 84,000 square feet. Uh, as I said, it's for 285 students. Um, it is we can get the fire access road around this site. Uh, and what we're looking at, also when we look at these projects, we try to figure out the site constraints, um, where we're gonna fit playing fields, how we're gonna do bus drop off, how we're gonna do parent drop off to make sure that the students are safe during those busy pick off and drop off times. Uh, so we're using, we have a landscape architect that we're working with. Uh, he did some of these hand sketches to sort of uh, flesh out initial site concepts. Uh, so in this option, what's happening is we're building a new facility on the flat part of the site where the, the current uh, softball fields are. And once that's done, we take down the original building. Uh, you can see the red dashed line is the, is the demoed uh, Cutler School. 
And then uh, the site amenities get constructed. So the playing fields, the playgrounds, uh, the outdoor classrooms and things like that happen after the first phase of new construction. Um, go on to the next one. So 3.3 is a uh, 645 student enrollment, so a quite a bit larger. Um, and uh, it's three stories. It's, it's essentially a two-story building that steps up the hillside because we have a lot of topography. That southernmost portion of that blue addition is actually up one level as a two-story volume. So we're taking advantage of the topography and the slope um, by stepping the building up with, while reducing some of the excavation and blasting that would be required to build this large, uh, larger footprint. Um, other options on this. So with, with the playing fields, another thing we're trying to do is accommodate the uh, softball diamond and the, soft, and the uh, soccer practice fields without having to overlap them. This does that, um, yeah. But it, but it only serves the Cutler and Winthrop population, so it doesn't take the Bucher students into, into consideration. And the final uh, C3.4 is a really similar kind of footprint. Uh, it's a slightly larger building. It's at uh, 132,000 square feet. Um, it's the same configuration of two stories stepping up the hillside um, and has really the same sort of site configuration for uh, bus drop-off, parent drop-off, and uh, other site amenities. So that is the long and short of the current options that we're studying. Sure. I think we want to have questions afterwards. Yeah, we only have one more slide. Huh? Yeah, yeah, we can. We got one more and, you, and we need you to have the microphone so we can hear you. Yeah. Yeah. So pop up this last slide and we'll, yeah. we'll wrap it up and open the questions to Nancy. Hopefully, we'll have another bubble. So Nick just wanted to, Nick wanted to remind everybody this is what's upcoming. Uh, as we said, we completed the PEP, the first phase of feasibility. Our package went into the MSBA. They've given us comments back. We've answered them. That allows us to move into the current phase or at the PSR, preferred schematic, where we're taking those 14 options that the MSBA had us investigate. We're narrowing them down with criteria, meeting the MSBA guidelines, and that's going to lead us to a preferred solution. So everything that we talked about, we got a little long, but all the things we talked about, that's what we've been doing. To what Eric said to make what could be possible. So everything that we talked about, we had a slide on, all fits into this slide that we had with the three boxes on it. These are the items that your team has been busy working on, along with Eric and school admin. So coming up, we have some more um, key milestones. I can't read that box. The, uh, the, the biggest of milestone, I could have gave you the mic too. The biggest milestone here is uh, the 22nd, the uh, school building committee will select the preferred option. Uh, one of those five remaining options uh, on your piece of paper. Uh, we will get into, we, you'll see a uh, facilities assessment subcommittee. That's the MSBA's facilities assessment subcommittee. They really challenge our team in the district as to uh, the ins and outs of the project and how it works and making sure it, it makes sense. Now this, uh, okay. Eric, I'll bring this back. I just want to make sure I understand um, the paper. So thank you for the great presentation. Um, so option, uh, let me put my glasses on. Which one? Point. No, no, this one, C3.3. So <clears throat> does that mean Winthrop would close and all the kids from Winthrop would be there? So that's one question. And, okay. And the C3.3. Four, that's my second question. Um, it would be the grades one through five and the kids from Bucher, so. I'll take it, I'll take it. Yeah. 
So the two options we're talking about, I'm going to steal your piece of paper right here. If you're looking at your paper, the two on the right, Cutler C3.3 and C3.4. Um, the C3.3 option, 645 students, would allow us to just move the K-5 to kids in Cutler and Winthrop into one place, leaving Buker just as it is. Um, K-5, to just exactly as it is right now, so all the kids from Winthrop would basically head over to Cutler. The next option, C3.4, is a combination of all kids grades one through five in the entire district. So all kids in grades one through five in the entire district. That includes the Buker kids, uh, which gives us the opportunity to turn the Buker school into an early childhood center housing our preschool classrooms, which the state does not allow us to build into this new program, but also our kindergarten kids. So we have a true uh, early learning center for our younger kids, um, really safe and cozy in the Buker if you've been in there, and then all the other kids in grades one through five will go to the new building on the Cutler site. So that's what, does that help? Okay. So the Winthrop would be determined by the town. So if we vacated the Winthrop school and moved every kid, all the kids over to the new school, the town owns the land and the building, so they would have to determine what to do with it next. Yep. Yep. It's just a quick one. Um, I wanted to know how many kids are in the Manchester um, Memorial School and how many kids are currently in the middle school and high school in Hamilton. Uh, Manchester was built for what, 365? 365 students in the Manchester School. Um, as you might know, Manchester and Essex have their own elementary schools. Uh, Essex also has an elementary school that they are now trying to rebuild. They just got accepted into the process five years later. They need to now go to the town and say, do we want to build another multi-million dollar building and stack that on the debt we have? Um, middle school and high school right now, you have 451 kids in the high school and 375 or four or five, I, can't, I think it was four, 374 kids in the middle school right now. Uh, one of the things we're seeing at the, the, across the school district, elementary school population is rising. We currently have 847 elementary schools from pre-K to five. That is the second highest number of kids we've had in the district in 11 years. The highest was just before COVID at 867. We are gaining on that every single year coming out of COVID. Um, I think that, does that answer your question? All right, there was one here, right? I'll come over. Thank, thank you. Uh, a comment and a question. Um, I, I noticed on your info sheet, you've got the cost of the project for each of the options. I think it's important to include the cost to the town. So that's clear, right? And it's going to depend upon how much money we get from the state. I get that. It should also include any of the remediation costs that would be associated with Winthrop coming down, right? Which is not going to be cheap. And, and Buker being redone. The other question that I have, and this is for you, Mr. Tracy, is your objective to improve the existing site or is it to put more students where Cutler is currently? What's the prime objective? So the prime objective is to give all of our students the best educational opportunity available to them within our district. We'll improve the site as we go. Even if we build a small school, we'll, we'll improve the site because things will change. Um, and the comment about the, the money, the one thing to keep in mind these are very rough estimates that are on there. Those are not final numbers. Uh, those are initial estimates based on these block diagrams. Um, the estimates as we go into the next phase, schematic design, become very tight. There is actually what I call a competition. Both the architects and the OPM bring in uh, individual uh, people who do the estimations and they'll re-estimate the project based on the schematic designs as they get drawn, like the plans of the, the building materials and things like that. And we'll get a tighter look at what that, what that is. Um, and then we'll look at reimbursement. Probably by the fall, the state will check in with us and say, here's where we'll reimburse this project. They'll give us a more exact number. And then we'll come to the towns with that to say, OK, here's the project. Here's the estimate at this time. Here's this possible state reimbursement. And also, I, I think it's wise to also include the, you know, if we have to demolish a building somewhere, or, or upkeep a building somewhere, those, those costs have to be included as well. So, good questions. Uh, 
uh, it's great to see the narrowing of options. Those at the first one when there were 15 or 20 or more, it seemed. Uh, two quick questions in follow-up. Uh, one, with C3.4, it's only comprehending one through five, so as discussed, something would have to be done. So as part of this work, is there going to be any kind of estimate on what that would cost? Because if, if, for example, that were the, the option that came to the town, inherently something would have to be done with pre-K and K that would cost something to renovate wherever those would go. So is that work happening here so that that would be ready in time for the vote for the town? I, I know it's a separate endeavor from what the state would reimburse in this effort that you're going through with the timeline, but some of these options would suggest, yeah, you could leave that alone and some other time you can fix it, but with this option, you'd have to do something. So is that part of the work that this group is doing? Good question. So what we've been doing along the way, yes, it is. Um, what we've been doing along the way is actually up, updating the Buker. We went in and updated uh, the gym first. Uh, last year, we put approximately $125,000 into the gym. Uh, we, current, we did the entire security system around the entire building. We've done, uh, we're starting work actually on the communications PA system so that we have a safe uh, PA system in the building. Right now we have the original 1950s switch plate uh, PA calling system. So upgrading communications and calling. We've upgraded technology. We've, we've um, taken approximately $275,000 each year for three years and updated technology across the entire district. Things like smart boards, computers, uh, Wi-Fi. We just did a full Wi-Fi, uh, quote, renovation, updating all the Wi-Fi uh, wi access points across the district, 245 access points, um, bringing them up to the current standard. We did that last summer. Uh, so we continue to do that. We're looking actually this summer at adding bathrooms between uh, some of our classrooms that don't have bathrooms in, that, in the Bucher School, but the, the classrooms themselves uh, would, would fit the need for pre-KK just based on their sizes. But the, the, uh, the kind of the, the project's kind of ongoing each year. Do you have a second one? I do. Um, my second question is um, how, how much um, pulsing, do you feel like you have a good pulse on the town and which of these options are more viable uh, or more objectionable? Um, because obviously you're doing some good work here from a pragmatic perspective to, to go through this work, but you're gonna get to one and that's gonna be the one the town votes on. Are, are you doing, do you have a, a st doing straw polls or do you feel like you have a pulse on, for example, there's lots of narrative about whether people want a big school or keep their small schools so that when we get to the one option, there's a likelihood that people would be on board. Like, has there been a two-way dialogue or is it mostly, let me update you, because I've, I've tried to come and it's, I wonder how much broad sentiment you're gathering as you're going quickly down this path to one option. Great question. Um, what we wanted to do is kind of hone in on, as you said, you know, we had like 15 options. It was overwhelming for people. So we waited until we've honed in on a much smaller focused number so that people can say, you know, I, I kind of like it's a smaller school idea. Or I kind of like the middle range school idea. Tonight's the, the first survey that's going out. Uh, you'll see it tonight. That was the slide that I made Nick go back on, but it's a QR code that'll give you all the opportunity to weigh in on what you saw tonight and what you heard. That will go public uh, tomorrow morning and we'll continue to put that out when we do these uh, meetings throughout the community. So when we go back to various places to present. I'm presenting Friday morning at the library to a group. Uh, we'll use it there and we'll just continue to do that. One of the things is the, the shift from what we're in now, feasibility, into schematic design is a big deal because now it takes it from those boxes. Those are just boxes. There's no really rooms associated with them. So now we actually hone in on this is what it actually looks like on the inside. These are the things that we can build into it and these are the things that make sense. That gives, I think, people a little more ability to say, okay, I understand that, rather than saying, here's 14 options in 14 different configurations for you to choose from, choose one. So we were just trying to round it down to get it to a point where people can uh, better focus on understanding. And that's what these are for, too, to help people understand, like the question in the back, the first question was really important about, okay, what really happens to all those first, second, third, fourth, and fifth graders in that larger scale option? All the kids in the district go to that one building. What happens if we just build the 285 student school on the Cutler site? Well, the Winthrop school stays open and those kids stay right there. The Buker school stays open and those kids stay right there. So these are all good questions that we're trying to get that information out so people can make a good decision. 
It's fine. Hi. Hold on a second. You've got one. You've got three mics. One. Oh. You've got one for us. You're on. Yeah, that makes it a little weird. It, Is it on? It's on. Yep. Okay, thank you. Firstly, um, I'd like to thank you all for taking the time this evening. Um, appreciate all the hard work you've done. Um, I was just wondering if we could go back to the slide that lists the five options. Maybe I don't see something here, but I'm looking at C2.1 and C3.1, and I'm seeing the addition of 64,000 square feet and almost 84,000 square feet, respectively, but it's still showing the same number of enrollments. Why is that? Okay. Sorry. Right, so with uh, 1.0 and 2.1? 2.1 and 3.1. So right, we're keeping existing. Right, right, right. Yeah, yeah, so 3.1 is all new construction, right? The, yeah. And 2.1 is renovation and new. So that's why the, uh, but the total number is the same. No, but my question is, if we add 84,000 square feet, it's an addition. Why is the enrollment still the same? I think I would expect the enrollment to be an increase in that. No, because this meets the ed, the, the ed program. The ed plan that the district wrote, we're meeting the ed plan in this new edition. So the, let me, maybe I can help. Yeah, maybe you can help. The, the C2.1 option is an addition renovation. So some of the remain, the, the current building would remain. So when you start to add up the total square footage, you're going to get less in that configuration because of like if you walk up the main hallway, you're still going to have the same classrooms, the same shell uh, of what's there now in the in the, the classroom wing of the Copter School. So in a newer school, the standards, if you're building a totally new school, this, the standards allow you to get uh, more space because the classroom space under the new regulations is allowed to be a little bit larger. So I think once you start comparing current space as it is versus new space, you'll start to see that that incremental difference. They're not identical, not identically the same, but they, they eventually will uh, house the same number of students only because that's the option the state gives us. The state, the state says to us, here are your four options, 285 students, 430 students, 645 students, and 740 students. You can't go outside of those windows, but you can come up with some options within that. So that's what we've been working on trying to figure out. That's what all, those other, all these other options were, different configurations. Right, and, and 2.1 and 3.1 are the same size, and it's, they're the same enrollment. So they are equal in terms of the total square footage serving that student population. Yes. Thank you for that explanation, but it, it, it's still bewildering to me how we can add 84,000 square feet and still only have the same amount of students in there. Um, but my other question was, can you remind me again why this only shows Cutler? Like, why are we only proposing Cutler? Can you remind me of why that is? Is it because of the decisions made by the others? Right, so we started out with 24 sites initially. All of them were not viable, except for the Cutler and Winthrop properties. As Eric explained at the beginning, um, the school building committee voted the Winthrop. Select board. The select board, sorry, off of the, out of the options. Um, they have a 50-year lease being renewed for the Cutler site and a five-year lease being renewed for the Winthrop site. And the MSBA won't uh, approve a school, a new school construction on the site with only a five-year lease. That's let me one take of the, a, that's let me, one of the reasons. Yeah, that's, that's yeah. really the reason. I mean, we lease all the school sites from the two towns. Um, so the school, uh, excuse me, I just did a select board, uh, last Monday voted to only renew the lease on the Cutler school uh, for 50 years, which is what we need to go to the MSBA to say we have, quote, control of the site. That gives us control of the site. Um, if not, then it could, have, it could have been, you know, the Winthrop School and not the Cutler. Both schools, it, it, it really, you know, as I said, this, the town is also 
uh, has opportunity to, to, to use the Winthrop site uh, for, to meet some of the other state requirements that have come about. I want to back up one second. When I, your C2.1 is 3.1. They're both the same total square footage. They both come out to 83,900 square feet. The, the C2.1, C if you look on the 19,800 square feet, that's going to be the existing piece that doesn't get knocked down. And then they, they're going to add on 64,145 square feet to that, you know, to the classroom wing, which we call it the classroom wing because that's where all of our classrooms are right now. So that the numbers end up identical, 80, 84,000-ish square feet for 285 students. And those numbers are really set by the state. They give us a, a number, and then they give us a uh, plan for s specific sizes of rooms that they will, quote, reimburse. So we're trying to stay within the window of reimbursement so we can get as much as possible. So right behind you first. Then, I'll give it, yep, then we can give it to Rick after. <laughs> Hi. Hi, sorry. Um, Apologize if you clarified this already, but the funding reimbursement from the state, when is that locked in? Is there a chance that we vote on the project and that the reimbursement rates suddenly change due to outside economic factors that might come into play? Or is that locked in by the time we vote? And then um, second question is, um, I know you've already kind of commented on this, but it feels like the town is influencing which building you choose a lot based on the MBTA laws um, and how much pressure is impacting what you guys will submit in April because the consolidated versions impact the student movement and traffic and cost of the taxpayers the most. So it would be beneficial if the town took that into consideration. Is this still on? Nick, could you put the slide up with the, um, the schedule of the bar? Do the reimbursement piece? Yes. Okay. I'll do the reimbursement piece first. So here's our timeline that Nick, we went over it, and I apologize quickly, we had so many slides. But the important part of your, your question is, no, we're not locked in now. We talked about that. We have a base rate where we're starting. We're incentivized to do things like sustainability and lead that will lead us to more points. We will know what our rate is before you go to vote. That'll happen in the next phase, Modular 4 Schematic Design, once we set what's called the Project Scope and Budget. We'll go to the MSBA with just what it sounds like. This is our budget because they gave us the reimbursement rate. This is the scope that they approved and then we will go out and seek the vote. Now the one caveat I have to throw at that is they're going to give us a reimbursement rate and it's a it's the rate that we strive to meet all along the way, the MSBA through the next four phases, they do audits on things like um, Eric said, space summary. Are we complying with the space summary? Did we overbuild? Is something bigger than what um, they allow throughout the state? That would be an ineligible cost. So that is our target to meet and maximize reimbursement and we do everything we can to get there. It's always subject to final MSBA audit, but that we'll have a rate before you go to vote. And I, I think there's some other ineligible costs too that are just standard. Certain hazardous materials and things. Yeah. Like that, that yeah. Like yeah. So there, there are, like, uh, at least you're saying there are, and we'll do this at a future um, presentation. We'll have a list of what some of the ineligible costs are. But that doesn't affect, you know, the, the, the 51%, or the 47 to 51%. That'll be a set rate. We'll have a sheet. They'll give it to us. It's part of a, the project scope of budget is a con, an amended contract with the MSBA. We cannot stray from that document. Once the MSBA board of directors votes for it, they'll make us start over. They'll send us back to another phase. So it's really the Bible moving forward, and it's belts and suspenders for the residents as well. When we tell the MSBA it has to be this much square footage of this configuration, and we get through all of their checks and balances of the feasibility subcommittee meeting, the MSBA board meeting, you bet they're going to hold us to that standard. Just, just one thing to add, I've been through two building projects previous to this in other communities, both different. One was a, one was a re renovation while kids were in there and the other was a totally new build. Um, the part of the reimbursement is also, you know, things that the community might want that the state might not agree to pay for. So in my previous district, we built a gym the community really wanted a second story track in the gym, 
so the kids could use the, the tracky around. That's not a reimbursable expense, so that's kind of on that other side of the 47%. Um, same with something like the same building, they had uh, a 120 piece orchestra. They wanted an orchestra pit in the, in the, in the front of the auditorium, so it would be right here. Uh, um, that expense is also not reimbursable, but the town was very willing to say we really want that, so we're willing to include that in the unreimbursable. So those are the decisions that get made along the way, and that's why you know, doing these forums, like what are people thinking about and where are people thinking about, like, you know, at some point we really have to do some, we'll have to do some value engineering and, and so say, okay, we might not be able to use this particular tile, we might have to use a different tile. So different things like that, will, decisions will be made along the way to get as much reimbursement as possible. Rick, you got so. Yeah, two questions. Uh, one is, uh, if the new construction options, uh, C1, uh, three and four are approved in April, 2025, what's the schedule for completion? and do they vary among options? The 3.3 .3 and 3.4 are both new builds. Um, when you look at the schedule, it's, yeah, put, go back to the, yeah, right. Right there. So if you look at the bottom of this slide, 2025, we're going to vote on an option. So pick an option. We're going to bring the 285 student option to the towns to vote if we want to build this or not. We make the vote, we move forward, and the construction completion would be in August 2028, moving students in at the beginning of that school year. So we've, been, we've kind of shifted to September start, so starting in early September 2028. That's, a, that's kind of an ideal build. If you go into renovation, it becomes a little bit longer. Hi. So the second question is, um, ha have you considered the operational savings by consolidating uh, both Bucher and, uh, and or Winthrop into the calculations? Um, I haven't seen anything about that. Yeah, we haven't got, actually gotten to that point yet because we weren't, at the, when we had 14 options, we weren't sure where, which direction we were going. Um, there are some operational savings, there are some efficiencies, busing is one. We now bus kids all over Hell and Creation. Like kids go on a bus and move to all three schools and it's kind of crazy, but it, it currently works. So I don't want to play around with it too much, but we use uh, you know, busing to one place versus two or three um, is cheaper. There are also costs like um, fuels, electricity. Uh, those costs all come into play. Uh, personnel, the reality is uh, if you decided you were gonna go with a 640 student option, the teaching staff would not change. I mean, our current, our current averages right now are about 21, 20 to 21 at the elementary level. Um, when you look across the district, we need all those teachers still in place because we don't want to artificially inflate our classroom sizes. We actually want to work to keep them at a reasonable uh, size. So there are some efficiencies outside of that. You have you know, three buildings, three nurses, three principals, three counselors. So there's, there's a lot of things that we look at as we Kind of shifted depending on which direction we go in. So yes, there are some efficiencies, but not huge efficiencies when you start looking at it. Maintenance, we spend, in the past just 10 years alone, we spent millions of dollars on both buildings when you start looking at some of the things that we've had to just do to, to keep kids in the building. So, okay, sorry. If the Winthrop site became available, how many potential or how much housing are we talking about MBTA housing wanting us to put there? Yeah, a lot. I, I, I couldn't answer it. I, I, I don't actually know. Um, do you know? Oh, Anna knows. Okay. I don't know. Um, one thing I want to make clear, I'm going to correct you, Eric, publicly in a recorded meeting, just like old times. Um, I know. I thought you would appreciate it. It's really important for people to know the MBTA law does not mandate housing. It mandates zoning. You have to zone for building, but you would still have to have a willing developer and a willing owner to play ball. So it's, it's not a mandate for, to build, it's a mandate to zone. Then once it's zoned, I think the question you're looking for is the state requirement is 15 units per acre within a half mile of the train stop. 
So what that means is within that half mile radius, you'd have to zone so that if someone wanted to build at that level of density, they could do so without the typical sort of uh, zoning hoopla. They'd still have to go through the process and it would still have to be approved. It wouldn't just be a total wide open door, but you'd still have to have, you know, an owner with a parcel of land. And it's just, that's all the law says. You have to zone for it. So what's, so what's that math then, if you're talking about, what did you say, 15 units? Per? I think the total, if you do 15 units per acre with a half acre, it ends up being like 750 units. 731. Yeah, per municipality. Okay. Uh, and with both Hamilton and Lenham, interestingly, because we're two municipalities on the same train stop. So the seven, that 700 number is for Hamilton and Wenham together, or? That's just Hamilton for each site. So that, okay. but that doesn't mean they'd have to build. That means no, but, it could be but zoned. That, but that, that means density. that site becomes available potentially for over 700 units. You, you would actually, that would be more density in that one site. I don't know that you could get that many, but I might defer to Rick Mitchell on the planning board on that. Yeah, so um, two qu I have a couple questions. One is, um, will there be any kind of traffic studies done on Asbury Street? Because it's, what we're talking about, it's already, sometimes you can only get one car through at pickup. So, so I, I, I'm just, you don't necessarily even have to answer. I'm just saying I want to make sure that there's some kind of traffic studies because it's a big shift. And people in Hamilton tend to like to pick up their kids. So, and then the other question I have, and maybe I came in late, so sorry if it's already been asked. But given the state of the state and the state of the budget, I think it's unrealistic for us to expect that they're going to reimburse more than required by state statute. So if it's 47%, I know maybe the recent history, they're cutting stuff everywhere. So I just am concerned about that. I, I can handle the, uh, the traffic study first, you and sure? then I'll defer if you want to. I'll let you answer the, the reimbursement question. There is a, there is a I'm, gonna, I'm just going to back into you. There, there is a, a traffic engineer as part of the team, and that's, it's, a, it's both a requirement and the right thing to do. So it's not been started yet because we need to narrow this down, but there will be, as part of this next phase, a detailed traffic study done of the site. The, 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 there'll be a look at the, um, you know, the history in the area. There'll be traffic counts done, live traffic counts, morning, afternoon. There'll be observations. There'll be a traffic study done, made public, and we'll, we'll, we'll share it at a, you know, a future a future meeting, but that is part of the process, and they are already part of the team. And you know, an interesting uh, investigation. Though we we probably could have had a slide on this. Uh, just a few weeks ago, we went out to the Cutler site with a geotechnical engineers and a boring machine in order to help inform the estimate that's going on right now. Our next this will be our second estimate. We had the geotech engineers poking holes, looking for rock, looking for soil characteristics that'll better help us inform the decision on, you know, what has to be done at that site to remove rock or soils. And the same thing will be done, same type of investigation, although not destructive for uh, traffic. The reimbursement part, as I said earlier, is, is the MSBA by accepting the statement of interest and then allowing the district to go into this pipeline, they've already counted on financing this project. We're part of their financial plan. When we get to project scope and budget, as I said, that's a contract, and it's going to say in there what our reimbursement rate is. And there'll be a certificate that backs that up. So there's twofold. So yes, we, we are part of their pipeline. It's not a guaranteed fund. In fact, there'll be some language when you go to vote that says something to that effect. You know, if the, what, you know what if the MSBA was to go away tomorrow? That's a different whole question. But project scope and budget, we're locked in. We got one right here. One first here. You got like one here, one there. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, what, so, what is, so what is the catalyst then for, for this project right now? School comes out like right now. What's the catalyst for right now? Right? It seems here it's the heavy gay bus pushing that along. Would we be having this today if that was not the thing? Well, just think of the small schools. You could have yeah. on maintaining those because the cost over time to maintain those. Right. The, yeah. Sure. My bad. I thought I had a deep enough voice. Yeah, you want to take her? Want me to go where I was going? Good. Yeah. So 
the MSBA program, grant program, they're a quasi-public agency on their own, Mass School Building Authority. They have uh, promulgated by law, legislature, and they have a set of rules that they go by. They're on their own. They are, I'm going to say, they're not influenced by the MSBA, I mean the MBTA zoning. They had a set of criteria that they accepted this project with, the statement of interest. How many statements of interest did we put in here? You, you tried for a couple five, of... Yeah, I believe five years. Five around, times. So well before the law. So started. after the fifth time, the MB, the MB Mass School Building Authority said, you've met the criteria of which the MBTA had nothing to do with. It was overcrowding, uh, imminent emergencies. There was, I don't know what the other categories are. ADA compliance. ADA compliance, correct, things like that. And they've accepted it. That was not, zoning had nothing to do with it. And it's not part of any phase going forward. I can tell you that none of the modules have anything to do. We're going to have to say that we, as Eric said, that we have a lease for 50 years in the property, and that's it. Go ahead. Sorry. Thank you. Going way back to your mention about the pre-K, so what happens in version C3.3 to preschool? Good question. The preschool would, would end up in the 3.3 and 3.4 would end up um, at the Buker school. Buker so, can, so Buker can absorb? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, because it, what happens with the preschool program, it changes almost every year on us. Some years we have one classroom, some years we have three classrooms. This year we have three. Next year we only have two projected, so it's, it's really kind of a moving target. We've, we've gone to now seven sections, seven groups, if you will, of each grade level, so seven Ks. Um, there's plenty of rooms in the Buker to be able to take on kindergarten and, and um, the preschool. So the reality is what happens with the preschool when, did you say 3.3, the 640 option? Right, the one where Buker would stay where it is yep. in totality. Yep. It can absorb the preschool as well. So that, that's one of the factors, the determining factors of what to do, and it's going to be based on the number that we have at the time that we have available. So right now we have three, we'll have two next year. I don't know if we'll have the year after that. Um, it may or may not be, be a possibility depending on uh, 640 is a combination of only Winthrop and Cutler minus the preschool. Now, you guys can correct me if I'm wrong. The, the, if, you, if you look, remember the building I talked about, the Manchester School, they have two preschool, class, two preschool classrooms. Those are not reimbursable by the state, so it's something we would just pay for to build into the, the program. Um, it's, it's one of those decisions you got to make. Do you want to pay, you know, do you want to pay for that or do you want to pay for this? So um, there would have to be a conversation and some really deep thought about what, what to do next with that because it's always a moving target for us. Preschool can't disappear though. Correct. Okay. We, we do not intend to make preschool disappear. So this has been a lovely infomercial tonight. You've done a fantastic job. You've worked really hard, and I appreciate that. But this has been an infomercial. Okay. You see the people in this room. I live in Realville. They live here in Realville with me. We are going to be the ones that have to pay for this. So it's not a matter of picking this tile or that tile or a music room or a kiva or this or that. We're going to be asked to fund this new school building on top of the turf fields that we've already been asked to fund, on top of reevaluations of our property. Everything's gone through the roof. And you've got a limited number of people in here with, I don't care who you are, we've got a limited pot to pull from. If I don't have the money in my bank account to buy food, I don't go out and buy a fur coat. And you're asking us to go out and buy a fur coat when a lot of people in these towns don't have money to pay their tax bills. The elderly don't have the money to pay their tax bills anymore. So what are we supposed to do? We disappear? I think a lot of the impetus, as this other gentleman stated, for what's going on here today and how pretty all of this is, is because the town's been after that Winthrop site for a long, long time. I think 760 or 745 Thank you. Of, of, that would be in the, the huge new Cutler School is unfathomable. We live in these two towns because they're small towns, they're quiet towns. We love the three schools that we have. And that crazy bus option has been wonderful for our children to be able to go from one house, 
one friend's house to another, help with after-school plans, and a whole bunch of other things. It's the way we live. The town wants to grab Winthrop. They want to put affordable housing there for the MBTA plan because the state wants all the things that the state wants. We live in a right to shelter state. I don't know if anyone has been seeing the headlines lately, but our, th those figures are through the roof. And again, the people in this room are going to be expected to pay for all of that. No one in here can tell me how, how we're going to pay for this. I, I don't know how you expect this to happen. I really don't. Is there anything? Thank you. OK, other side of the room. I didn't, I'm not trying to brush you. I didn't see your question. Hi. Uh, I'd like to okay, first go to the side. Thank you for the presentation. Um, definitely some of the, the plans for the physical, the, the architecture, I think will be really strong improvements from, you know, from what we have for the current facility. So that the, those look like a good thing to me in a general sense. However, I think, as we've heard from multiple people here, there are really two issues. There's the educational, of course. Your mission, education mission is important, crucial, and having up-to-date facilities is a crucial thing. At the same time, it's colliding with a zoning issue, which is affecting not just, just this town, but towns all over the state. And as we see, some towns like Milton are kind of even in revolt against some of the state's mandates. Um, I predict that we have five choices. If we go for a consolidation and give up the Winthrop site, it's not going to pass at any meeting in 2025. People are going to be aware that it's going to be used for more housing and a lot of units. And if it's that many units with children, you'll have to even expand the school system more. It's just, if you want it to succeed, in my opinion, just of watching zoning and stuff like this for, in the town for a number of years, there'll be huge resistance against going for a consolidated Cutler, Cutler plan if you're going to give up the Winthrop because this MBTA zoning thing is, I, I consider it something in flux that may, may or not even be necessarily, um, you know, the, the town may have accepted the zoning or not, but I don't see that as going to be popularly acceptable and it will fail if you, if you try to get rid of the color site for, uh, for the school there. And, um, you know, I'd like to see something succeed that does work and some of the plans seem to work, but otherwise I think what you're all hearing, and it's good to be on the record with this with the town and have a meeting like this, I appreciate that. I didn't know this meeting was going to exist until uh, the town manager, he, did, he had put a phone call to everybody. It wasn't even on the town website, it might be mistaken, it, might, it was on the, H, the school's website, not the town's, and it's very important for the town, not just for the education, but also for the zoning controversy that's, that's currently roiling the state for good reason. Thank you. Appreciate it. Great points. Um, you know, that, that's the reality of why we're doing these forums. We want to hear from people, you know, my, my group, if you will, I can always access people who have school-aged children. Send them, send them an, you know, an email every Friday uh, outlining all the things we're doing. So these types of forums are important for us to hear the things that you're saying, for this group to hear it, but also there are people on the select boards and FinCom sitting in the room right now that will also hear it as we have those discussions. Um, the, the realities of town decisions and school decisions are always going to clash. We are, you know, it's just, it's just kind of these small towns that's, that's really what happens. I mean, we start to look at everything in a, in a full sense and not just focus on one thing. So there's a balancing act there too. And you know what? We may not build a school at all. That option is still there. There's still a reality to say, nope, we're not gonna build it and we'll keep what we have. Um, that, that's, you know, no one's ruled that out. I wanna be very clear about that. Uh, it's just part of the process. We go to you know town meeting and you say, okay, we'd like to build this X number of kids school then the towns say no. We're back to square one when we have three schools and kids K to five, pre-K in, in Winthrop, but K to five in, in the other schools. So, you know, it's, I appreciate the, the commentary. I think it's important for everybody here. I think it's important for, for us to have that out there publicly. And we'll continue to do these meetings and continue to bring updates forward and continue to listen. Like you'll, you'll have an opportunity to do a quick survey uh, right after this and you can do it at any time because it'll be located on the website. As far as the, the town, I think the town manager's report that he puts out every couple of weeks has had it in there a few times. So if you don't get the town manager's report, uh, I think you can sign up for those and get your email on there. Uh, you can always sign up for school stuff on the school website. 
we, uh, as soon as we finish something, we update it on the site. So it's as up to date as, you know, tomorrow morning, this presentation will be on that site uh, for you to review. And there's always an opportunity for you to ask questions. There's an FAQ box on our website and we get some great questions. We take them, we bring them to this group here, we answer them and we post them on the FAQ that's on the school website. So a lot of these questions that kind of were asked early on are now evolving through this process. So really appreciate the feedback and we'll continue to, to look and listen and get an idea of where people are at. You know, the, the, time, the reality of money is real. I live in a community, same thing. You know, the community I'm involved in is also a regional district and $150 million school was built and my taxes went up as well. So it's, I get it, I feel it too. And, and I think, you know, for us to continue to be out working and listening and digging into different groups of people is important for this whole process. There was a question back there. Go ahead, sorry. All right, thank you. Uh, Superintendent, I appreciated your comments earlier about speaking about the importance of education and equity as it relates to this project. Um, and I guess I would want to follow up on that and just, I guess, implore you as a, as a school district not to lose sight of that in regards to what's happening in the schools right now. This project is obviously years away, and I want to just highlight the fact that there are needs in the school today, and especially looking at the Cutler School, right? If you look at the, the DESE accountability reports for our schools, there is a massive difference between Winthrop and Buker, which get an accountability percentile rating of 83 and 85%. Yep. The Cutler School is at 53%. That's a huge difference. Right, and I know this is a really important project, but at the same time, I just want to emphasize the fact that let's not forget about what's happening in the schools, inside of the schools, between now and when this project actually gets implemented. Um, equity within our schools should be a goal, and it should be a goal for the present day, not just in regards to this project. Thank you for that, I agree 150%. The, the reality is we are addressing that issue through our MTSS development. Go back to, again to my entry plan. One of the first things I noticed was the inequities across the curriculum from school to school to school at the elementary level. So you go into a third grade classroom in the Buker, it was very different in the Winthrop and it was even more different in the Cutler. Uh, we brought in a new literacy program the first year, which was last year. Uh, started using that literacy program and then added on top of that an intervention program. So we are doing uh, an assessment called Dibbles three times a year, which allows us to track uh, kids' improvements in literacy um, using science of reading and helping us to understand like where kids need the assistance. We have three people in each building that are specifically assigned to doing interventions based on the results of those assessments. So there are um, adults both in the classroom, the classroom teacher, and adults outside of the classroom whose sole job it is for intervention. So that's part of the process. The other part of the process is addressing the math need across the entire district. The, the math need across the entire district is real. We've spent, you know, the director of teaching and learning has spent this entire year working uh, from K all the way up through the high school, trying to bring in a uh, new consistent math program so that ki again, kids are getting all the same uh, opportunities and, and equities along the way and that includes you know walking through classrooms if you've read my newsletters we walk through classrooms constantly the director of teaching and learning and I the director of, of uh, student services myself principal so that we can see in each building where things may not may or may not be going on we brought in a consultant from CKLA which is our literacy program three weeks ago to walk and sit in classrooms in every single building give us feedback on what she saw for consistencies and equity so we are examining those things Another piece is attendance. School attendance is, uh, you know, a big piece of the puzzle and the accountability game, which is uh, good and bad. You know, the, the Cutler school attendance is, is impacting that as well. So the principal, uh, Juliana Snyder, has been really working on attendance, calling parents, bringing parents in, trying to figure out ways to get, make sure kids come to school every day. So there are, there are a number of avenues being addressed right now. Um, we're, and we'll continue to, to grow that as, you know, people may know we're shifting. We have a new principal coming in in the fall and accountability has kind of been in her backyard where, where she was previously, so that would be helpful as well. Could you speak to the current health hazards in these three schools? Uh, I'm talking specifically mold, mildew, asbestos, and how much 
that was considered in the process by your team? I can speak to some of it. Um, asbestos is an issue in every school. I mean, anything built in the 50s, you know, tiles, ceiling tiles, floor tiles are kind of the primary place you find asbestos. We do abatements each summer um, in the buildings. Like right now, we've been focused on the Bucher School. We did um, the fifth, fourth and fifth grade hallway classrooms last year. This year, we're doing the third and second grade classrooms for abatement. So. We've been trying to address that a little bit at a time. It's cost about $12,000 per classroom to abate the tiles on the floor and get new tiles back in there. So we do a few, few each year. Um, issues like boilers, uh, heating, and, and, and no air conditioning, heat mostly. Uh, we have individual ventilator units that are original to the building. We have rooftop units that are original to the building that are at end of life. We've had consultants come in and tell us, you know, you're. These units are original to many parts of the building and will fail at some point. So right now we're just addressing these issues as they come up. So a lot of the equipment is original, a lot of the windows, uh, things like that. There's cracks in the foundations, cracks in the facades of, of uh, the buildings. Uh, there, was, there was a number of issues with the envelope at the Winthrop School that had to be addressed. So there's quite a few. And you, there's, a, there's kind of a long list, if you will, this, the ADA compliance issues. Are, are real, you know, some of the ramps that are in the Cutler School aren't at the appropriate angle for a child in a wheelchair. Um, there's a really difficult time to get a child from one level to the next level because there's a lift that has to be put into place, it has to be set up by an adult, used by an adult to get that child to the cafeteria, for instance. Uh, so there's a lot, of, a lot of things like that. We, we, had, we were kind of in the position to have to replace the boiler in Cutler last year because the, the other boiler that was in there just totally died. Um, we're fixing leaks around the facility uh, constantly. We dug up uh, a water inlet leak in the middle of the parking lot last year, and now I have a new one this year that we're going to address uh, in the spring. So there's, there's a number of things on that list. Um, there's sound, there's air, you know, the ventilation systems are uh, rough at best. And the, the Cutler School is interesting. There's like one little vent in the top of each classroom. Uh, some of the classrooms have individual ventilator units. Uh, that are that are original, and we just keep them, try to keep them running, putting MERV 13 filters in them, and keeping the the engines, the oils, uh, motors oiled, and belts changed, and things like that. But at some point, you you kind of start losing the battle. Leaky roofs. I mean, there there are leak, roofs leaks everywhere uh, in all the buildings, and, and then the the heating controls are pneumatic in both the or parts of the color and all of the Winthrop. Pneumatic controls are difficult at best to control. We don't have any ability to, to control them by a computer or anything. We have to actually go in physically and figure out that, you know, in that particular room what's wrong with the thermostat, the pneumatic line that goes back to the original system. So there are, there are quite, a, quite a few things that would be addressed. <clears throat> Got one more right there. Yep. I, I, uh, I just want to confirm my understanding. I heard earlier, I think you said that essentially C1 and C2.1 are not legitimate options. Is that is that correct? So if you're looking at it at the basis of the ed plan, they wouldn't meet the ed plan um, because of the way the ed plan is designed around the reality of education and the MSBA is, PA is requiring us to look 50 years in the future, you know, kind of future proofing your building. That is a, a physical reality that I don't know that anybody could do. So it's it's really kind of that long term look of what we have versus what we need. So the ed plan is sort of the guy is the North Star for this Correct. effort. Correct. And these two options don't meet the needs of that objective. Yeah. Just one. Just yeah, one. just C 1.0 does not meet the Ed Plan. Okay. Yeah, C 2.1 does for the 285 student enrollment at Cutler. Okay. Yeah. It would, I think it would be helpful to, like for everybody that's not here tonight, to make that clear to the community that like this is in here as an obligation to a state agency or something like right. that, because I, I look at it as, you know, something to consider when in reality, we shouldn't be considering that. Um, the, the second w thought I had was, and it's getting back to the square footage question, and, and I, I, I'm still wrestling with how do you add 38,000 square feet to a building and not increase the capacity for students? And maybe that's for the architects, but I'm, I'm still wrestling with that. Are you looking at the, the C2.1? 
So C 2.1, so the original building takes 285 students. So that's 1.0, 45,800 square feet, 285 students. C 3.1, we're adding 38,000 square feet. But the, but the capacity for students stays the same. That doesn't, and, and again, I'm not an architect, I don't build stuff, but I don't understand how, how that works. So maybe we can go back to that. So at, at 45,800, we do not meet the ed plan. I'm right? talking for about 285 students. students. Yeah, okay. But for C2.1, we're at 83,945, right, for 285 students. And the new construction, C3.1, is the same size for 285 students. So the first one doesn't meet the ed plan because it's, it's not enough square footage. It's too small. Yeah, to, yeah, yeah, it's too small to accomplish the goals, right? It's missing program. It's missing program, right? Yeah. Yeah, sure. All right, carry on. One, one, one way to one way to think about this is the MSBA give the MSBA gives a template that lists room sizes for all the classes, lists the kind of spaces you need to have size of your gymnasium, size of your cafeteria, art room, music room, there's a template. It's a spreadsheet, it's an Excel spreadsheet that we get. It's on their website, anybody can go look at it and you can fill, you can fill it out. If you, were, well, if you were to apply those standards to the current building, which is what's in the base option, the rental, op the, the rental option, you would not fit 285 students in that building. If you used their standards per room and all the spaces that are missing, that would no longer be a 285 student, that would be something less than that. So the base building, the classrooms are smaller, you don't have the right size spaces, you don't have all the spaces that are required for a current, for a current MSBA funded school at 285 students. Is that beginning to get any closer to, to understanding? I see a few heads nodding. I don't know if the gentleman who asked, asked the question. Oh, well, Kevin's answering, okay. I see a microphone back there. Yep. Go ahead. Okay. Um, two questions. First, if C3.1 happens to be approved, would that be designed in such a fashion that if in the future you wanted to add some square footage to bring in, say, Woodthrop students, it could be done with relative ease? I know you lose some efficiency if you don't do everything all at once, but could that design be made for 3.1 so that there would be minimal impact in uh, going to um, the next um, larger size. And the same question would hold if you went from C3.3 to 3.4. Great question. The state requires future expansion. So here's an example in front. There's the building in blue. There's a yellow square to the left side corner. Can you see that yellow dotted line? That's future expansion. So the state requires the architects and designers to lay the building on the plot, but also show areas where they could possibly expand the building in the future. So that's just, that's just an example. Again, these are very rough. So yes, there, there is always um, opportunity for expansion. Even the school, the Manchester Memorial Elementary School we went to, uh, there are space on that lot for future expansion if they wish to. Keep in mind, these um, numbers are inflated by the state by 40 to 50 students in some cases, when you think about the number of students we actually have in our district. Um, because they're, they, what happens in, in some cases, you have a fairly substantial number of uh, people in town with kids of not yet school age, so they, they go through this whole calculation of birth rates and death rates and move-ins and purchase, house purchases and, and try to come up with those numbers. So our, like I said earlier, the number of kids that we have in our total elementary pre-K to five is 847. So if you just take our pre-K and K out of that, you're looking at 580 students. So your capacity is, is much greater to add students as you, as you um, move, go down the road. So they're looking for the possibility of giving room for expansion and, and, and not running into a situation where you have, don't have enough room. So that's, that's kind of how the, the MSBA forces us into that mode.
Yeah. Take, take two more. Let's take two more. It's getting late. Okay. Okay. We'll give we'll give people the opportunity to do the survey. You can ask questions on there. You, we we'll, we have plenty of time. We'll do questions from now till town meeting. Hi. Okay. So I just wanted to um, clarify something. When we talk about the Ed Plan, I've come to a lot of these meetings, and um, it has been said numerous times that the Ed Plan is aspirational. Is that, is that still correct or is that not correct anymore? So the Ed Plan is really looking at what we have now and what makes sense for the future. What we could have, I correct. believe were yep. your exact words. Okay, so yep. I, I think it's important to let people know that, um, for instance, if the town decided that they could only afford the Cutler C1, that even though it doesn't necessarily meet the Ed Plan, it might be what people feel they can afford. And I think it's important that you point that out, that the Ed Plan is aspirational. And if anybody here has read the Ed Plan, it is very aspirational. And there's nothing wrong with an aspiration, but I think we also have to look at financial realities. Yeah, I mean, piece of the Ed Plan also makes us work within the bounds of what we have. So programs, for example, like special education, programs like music, um, they, don't, they don't let you say, oh, we want to add an, an orchestra room, a, a chorus room, a music room. So it's not that aspirational, but it does say, we'd like to put the pieces in place to give our kids the most successful possibilities while they're in our school district. And yes, there are efficiencies that get caught along the way. You, you start looking at your building and you, know, you start saying, wow, that's a lot of money. Okay, where can we trim back? You, know, you might remove something along the way. And again, I'll go back to the project that I did. They, they didn't have to choose to put an orchestra pit in and they didn't have to choose to put, you know, the, the second floor track in and that saves money on the non-reimbursable side. So yes, you're right, you, but it's a value engineering thing along the way. But it's, but it's yeah. for right, it's a baseline for reimbursement. So the, the, the Ed plan gets reviewed by the MSBA and they use that for a baseline for reimbursing the projects, the, the four kind of options on the project. Right, the first C point one would not be reimbursable at that rate, actually at all. Yeah. The, the, there's, a, there's a major repair plan through MSBA also, right? It's in that contract? Um, it, it's, it's, yeah, the major repair plan, so, so different statement of interest, different process. So the good example of that is the high school roof. Uh, high school roof leaks like a sieve throughout the whole facility and We've put in that uh, statement of interest to the state. It's a separate program. In fact, last year they shut the program down for applicants because of the cuts that were made. They have recently just started it back up. But it's a different program. It doesn't, I don't think it takes into account a full size building. It really takes into account like, do you need windows replaced? Do you need a roof replaced? So yes, in some, in some ways you might, but it wouldn't it come near to covering the cost of a full renovation. Agreed. Yep. One more question. I have just a couple comments for you. Make sure you do the traffic study. I live in the neighborhood. A lot of people pick up their kids. And is there any way you could put the new construction C3.1 where you've got C2.1. So we don't lose that open space down in the flatland. It's the only open space in the neighborhood. It's lovely to see when you drive up Asbury Street. It's really nice to have the school tucked up on the hill. You could even slide it down. I know this ledge there. I saw you guys out drilling. I went and looked at the little drill spots. It's just, it would be tough to lose that part of the neighborhood. Yep. And I don't know, you have a lot of people parking on Woodland Mead. 
I'll do one more. One more, right here. One more. Last question. Thanks. We'll let you do the survey. Um, first of all, thanks for everything tonight. I understand that this is the third and final um, community forum about this project. Is that correct? Not correct. Okay, I saw it on the website, so I appreciate that it's not because I'm in a butter to the Cutler School. I saw your drilling rig out there the other day through my kitchen window. Nobody has reached out to us to even let us know about these meetings. My neighbors didn't know about this. There's a lot of elderly people in town that aren't on Facebook and they're voting and you're not getting the information out there. How are you going to get a, a pulse for what the people in this town want if you're not reaching out to them on every level today? I got a robocall, and the other day, I got a mailer, finally. But I, my kids walk through the kitchen door out to Cutler School. That's a terrible way to communicate, and you guys are educators. You're supposed to know how to talk to people. Talk to the citizens and the, and the voters in this community for all of the options that are going to be decided upon by you, because it seems that on April 22nd, there's going to be a select board meeting and you're going to have your preferred option. That's one option that somebody is going to decide that's not living in this town maybe or not sending children to school or not paying the taxes that every one of us are. I'm not a very eloquent person, but I'm passionate. I love the Cutler School. I love where I live, but I feel like things are just kind of coming like a tidal wave and we're not all getting the opportunity to know what it's about. Sure, and we'll continue to do the public forums. Please this is, reach out to people yeah, other than the, electronic. The postcards came out as we rounded things down. We were looking at different ways to reach different people, including the elderly. We did uh, the COAs. We've been at the COAs. We're going to Library Friday. So we've been trying to be around and about town. We use Twitter. We use Instagram. We use Facebook. We use my weekly message. Joe uh, Domalovitz, the town manager, sends out about every couple of weeks something in his email. So. Keep, keep, you know, keep on those, those types of things. We'll continue to reach out. What's that? I'd have to ask. I haven't looked, so I'd have to ask. Uh, just, just real quick on the, uh, the neighbors. Um, we, we, we do plan on having a neighborhood meeting. We wanted to wait until a site was chosen. It doesn't make sense to have neighborhood meetings with two different neighborhoods where well, one might not even get a site, right? Um, Actually, as a matter of fact, we've already been um, speaking with one of the neighbors at the color site that asked, hey, if, if a project does happen here, can you make sure that we have the right bushes and the right trees that I can still have my privacy? So we are keeping in touch with those as well. And we'll continue to do that. These forums will not go away. They will continue to happen all through from now through schematic design. We'll continue to, to meet during the fall, during the winter, as we uh, grow this project. So it's, it's one of the... The hallmarks where we're trying to continue. I'm sorry, I have to interrupt. I apologize. I don't mean to be rude, but you got it all wrong. To shove one option down the people of this town is completely inappropriate. It then gets perceived as a done deal. I've been through this before. I've seen this. It's not my first rodeo. You guys have to engage. I'm sorry. This is a miss, whether it was intentional or not. You guys have to engage the community. Otherwise, this is what you get. Thank you. You get so, an us versus them. You splinter the community, and we end up losing. Everybody ends up losing. You can't go to the neighborhood after it's all done. This, we are direct abutters. We had no idea. And I'm on Facebook, and I pay attention to everything. And I had no idea this was so far down the pipeline. And we all know sitting here which option you all want because in plain English, it will line your pockets. And I don't mean to be rude, but that's just the fact of life. None of these people get a choice. Well, they're not, well, on the, well, well, they're well, not part of the school but building committee. they're going to get paid if we go with it. Uh, with it's, not a, it's, it's not valid. The, the school building committee is made up of Wait, people in the community, Tracy, teachers. I'm not paid to be here tonight. Neither am I. Well, yes, you are. I know I forgot. It's twenty-four-seven. The 
the reality is the school building committee is made up of town administrators, town managers. All we're asking is please be more transparent Absolutely. and let the abutters know. Absolutely. Can you put up the thing? I want to make sure that people have the opportunity to weigh in on the survey. You can pop it up on your phone if you, with the QR code up here. We'll also make the QR code available on the website tomorrow at the school district website. So if you can't do it tonight, you can do it tomorrow. Um, there's also a box at the end to ask questions or give comments. If you don't have a cell phone or don't know how to use this technology, there are some paper versions right down here in the front uh, that have just been brought down. So. Thank you very much. We will continue to have these forums and continue to work with the community. We appreciate the feedback. Uh, it's very helpful as we grow this process along the, the next uh, almost year. So just going to be about a, a year. So thank you very much. Have a good night.